ගණන් බැතිමතුන් නව දින පුදබිම සෙල්ල කතරකම ගම්පාස ඉන්ටර්මෙන්ම පුදබිම වන්දනා කරන බැතිමතුන්ට නිදහසේ පිරිසිදු ජලය බීමට ජල පෙරණයක් ගම්මැද්ද ජන සතු කළ වගයි ගම්මෙත් රට නගන ජන පෞර News first news line with Faraz Shaukat Ali on TV1 and very good evening to you and a warm welcome to news line today it's a recording and done earlier this evening my guest this evening is uh, Ms Sankita Gunratna who's the deputy executive director at Transparency International Sri Lanka very good evening Sankita and welcome to the program good evening Faraz thank you so much um is anti all sorts of bills but today we're not talking anti terrorism bill we're talking anti corruption bill and uh, perhaps we can get our guest to tell us um what is this anti corruption bill thank you for us and thank you for having me this evening pleasure so in terms of the anti corruption bill what it does is it seeks to repeal and replace three laws that are currently in existence that is the bribery act the commission to investigate allegations of bribery or corruption or seabock act that's the act that sets out the parameters of the bribery commission mm. and then the asset declaration law of 1975 now these laws have been in existence for a couple of decades and they have ceased to be fit for purpose over time and needed to be updated uh, certain fines needed to be updated new forms of corruption have uh, the need to be recognized there are international norms and standards that need to be incorporated and enabled into uh Sri Lanka's domestic law so that's what this law seeks to do and sets out to do mm. the this uh, since anti corruption bill doesn't target any particular group of people it's not intended to what it does it it sets out the framework of uh the of anti corruption in Sri Lanka the large, broad contours of it and uh, it doesn't necessarily identify groups of people but it uh, recognizes forms of corruption mm -hmm. um but it it's sort of linked uh, one of the things it's linked to is your asset declaration yes. so does that go to the heart of uh, Sri Lanka's parliament yes it does so for years our organization transparency international sri lanka has been asking that asset declarations not should not only be filed and then hidden away in some confidential uh, file and back office somewhere but that they should be available for public consumption for public debate and perusal so that the public can also and the voters can make up their own minds as to whether they're voting for candidates and people who are actually acting in the public interest and not in the private inter interest of a private gain mm -hmm. or for illicit enrichment so in terms of that campaign for years we know uh, that there have only been 16 17 mps who have on their own made their asset declarations public mm. but in this bill what it requires um, should be done is that the bribery commission will have a central electronic uh, platform where all asset declarations will be submitted electronically mm -hmm. and within 3 months of them being submitted that a redacted ver version where personal information and sensitive information is redacted mm. would be made available for public consumption right. so it it goes to the heart of the matter in that sense uh, in two ways one is by enabling public access to asset declarations and secondly by ensuring that all information is available in one place so that law enforcement can actually take action because what happened so far as i said was that they were hidden away in files and offices and cupboards in uh, across a disparate number of uh, public authorities mm. but no one would check them and flag them up and verify whether illicit enrichment has indeed happened but this electronic system would have a red flag system that would flag up if there has been a sudden acquisition of wealth or a suspicious transaction that has been mm -hmm. uh, identified is this many moons away 
So according to the agreement that Sri Lanka has made with the IMF, uh, this law is intended to be passed by June this year. So it may be as close as two months away, mm. uh, but it still needs to get through Parliament. It may be challenged in the Supreme Court. We know that it was uh, placed on the order paper of Parliament yesterday. Mm. Um, so subject to those hurdles being passed, and we are requesting that certain changes, further changes be incorporated into this bill so that it can indeed actually address the thing, things that it seeks to address. Um, and then we are hopeful that it will be passed. Uh, okay. Um, it's often asked, um, so let's focus on that. What are the good things about this anti-corruption bill? Okay. So one thing is that it recognizes offenses that were not recognized as offenses before. For example, it brings private sector bribery within the ambit of this law. So that if is, somebody, what does that mean? Somebody from the private sector tries to bribe somebody in the government sector, then that bribe giving person is also responsible. That is already part of the law, right. but the current law doesn't isn't adapted to uh, hold the private sector responsible. The, the offences are not geared for the private sector. So this, to some extent, fixes that problem. But in addition to that, it makes private sector bribery vis-a-vis -vis another private sector en entity also, it brings that also within the definition of corruption or bribery. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing it does. A second thing it does is that, and, and this is a debate that is happening right now, about sexual bribery. Mm -hmm. Now, sexual gratification was previously also um, encompassed within the Bribery Act under the definition of gratification. That is, if a person went and made complaint to the Bribery Commission, they would take a sexual bribery complaint also under the definition of gratification and take action where there was evidence. Mm. However, this law actually goes a step further and specifically recognizes sexual gratification as a form of gratification, which in practice means that it will become a norm for... Um, cases of sexual bribery uh, to be complained about. It will be more normal for prosecutors to choose that as the offence that they prosecute under. So that's a good thing and that it, the law goes further in that respect. Mm. In addition to that, uh, we already talked about the asset declarations. So that is something that is new. We know under the present asset declaration law, even if I were to uh, access and obtain an asset declaration law, if I were to talk about it or show it to you, I could be liable to rigorous imprisonment mm. and or a fine. And that just really flies in the face of, face of transparency and accountability uh, of public mm. officials and uh, public representatives to the public. So that is a huge step forward. Um, in addition to that, this law has also increased the powers of the Bribery Commission or the proposed law proposes to increase mm. the powers of the Bribery Commission. It allows for surveillance, recording, so it gives them a toolbox uh, of, of uh, armor, I mean not armor but weaponry in a sense, uh, to uh, take action against corruption. However, we know that laws are prone to abuse in Sri Lanka, so these should be subjected to judicial review and uh, used carefully. Mm. Um, and the fines related to bribery and corruption have been increased, sometimes as far as uh, up to 1 million rupees, 10 years imprisonment, and also the ability to recover um, any loss that has been caused to the state or to government. So in these ways, the law is different. So these are good things mm. uh, about the law. And also sports-related corruption has been incorporated within the law. Oh, I see. So uh, Max Fix thing? Yes, parts of these things have been uh, brought into the law, but there is further for it to go, which are pro part of the proposals we're making as well. <clears throat> On the basis that this is passed in whichever way, mm. uh, cut down or whatever, once it becomes law, which will become the dominant law then? Will it be, you know, if, uh, let's say, a cricketer is caught uh, in, on a max-fixing charge, would he, be, would he face charges under some, uh, the previous or the current one, which is probably against the Sports uh, Act? The Sports Act. Um, or will this new anti-corruption uh, laws come in place? Both laws can act concurrently, will be in operation concurrently, where there is an, uh, a conflict, this law would prevail. Right, okay. Um, does, is, does this bill, the anti-corruption bill, um, address any form of corruption that may arise from 
uh, political funding. This law doesn't seek to cover that. That is already covered under the Campaign Financing Act, mm. not to the extent that we would like. Mm. But uh, party financing, um, candidate financing and independent group financing, yeah. both in terms of income and expenses, donations and expenses, are covered under the Regulation of Campaign Expenditure Act and not under this law. Excellent. And um, uh, what, what do you think... Uh, Okay, what are the main bones of contention against this bill then? Yes. So, as we, uh, we've stated before as well, we welcome this bill. It seeks to be in compliance or in, in accordance with the UN Convention Against Corruption, which is a good thing and it, in, um, it incorporates a lot of new offences and new aspects of corruption into the law. It clarifies certain points. However, we've uh, flagged up two major concerns. One being around the right to information. Now we know in 2016 when the Right to Information Act was passed, it was intended to be the one piece of legislation that would govern the area of information disclosure. Mm. And it's a good one. It stands today in fourth place when the right to information laws in the world are ranked. So we don't want a situation where subsequent legislation comes into place and whittles away at that information disclosure regime. Mm. Now, under this law, uh, what happens is that any official officer who joins the bribery commission, the commission to investigation alle investigate allegations of bribery or corruption, mm. would sign an oath of secrecy. And this is... Uh, I mean, manifested, this is in order to retain the secrecy of investigations, ongoing investigations, and that is understood. Mm. However, when they sign an oath of secrecy, the information officer of the organization, the CIABOC, would also be signing this oath of secrecy. So, then you come to another section in the law where it says that information can be disclosed, uh, subject to the exceptions in the RTI Act, but when information is disclosed, the director, it is the director general who does it with the authorization of the commission. Right. Now, under the Right to Information Act, it would be the information officer who makes an independent decision. So you add two additional layers of authorization to the information disclosure process. Hmm. And here, this act says that it will override all existing law, written law which means then this, that this would prevail over the right to information law. So we argue that that is bad in a policy sense because we shouldn't have the information disclosure regime fragmented in that way because then no one will be able to definitively say it gets really confusing. Mm. And uh, secondly, the right to information is a constitutional right of citizens, which means that we shouldn't be derogating from it by way of uh, later... Uh, legislation so this remains a problem another concern that we have and uh, we are hoping that this will also become part of public debate and it's a technical issue in the law where where candidates are required to submit their asset declaration at the point of nomination along with their nomination papers to the election commission as is done now or is supposed to be done now and to the bribery commission as well to the online system however According to the current provisions in the law, uh, it is only within three months of receiving an asset declaration that the bribery commission is required to make it available online, that redacted version that I was talking about. Uh, then that means uh, a citizen will not have access to an asset declaration of a candidate until after an election, right. practically, which means your right to sovereignty, your right to information, your right to vote would be violated in that sense. Uh, by your inability to make up your mind about who you would vote for in an election by being able to access an asset declaration. Another point, and this has been the subject of considerable debate, is section 119 of the Act, which states that if a person makes a false complaint to the bribery commission, knowing that it didn't, uh, knowing that it was false, and knowing that it doesn't amount to an offence under this law, uh, that they would be liable, they could be liable to a fine of 1 million rupees and uh, an imp uh, up to imp in, uh, 1 million rupees and imprisonment of up to 10 years. Now, uh, the argument has been made that this is to deter false complaints. Uh, however, we have to keep in mind the context that we are operating in. 
mm. in this context of law enforcement failure of law enforcement being sometimes captured for political purposes uh, law enforcement not being independent and sometimes influenced mm. whether that kind of provision can lead to um, stultifying or stultifying or discouraging whistleblowers from making complaints or discouraging complaints or making them think twice about the possibility of going to the bribery commission in case they're victimized or unfairly victimized using this kind of provision. Now, there are the granted, there are the provisions that say that um, if you knew, if, if you believed it to be true at that point of time, then you wouldn't be liable. Mm. However, in this day and age, and, and my perusal of the UN Convention Against Corruption, which this is supposed to be in accordance with, doesn't have that kind of provision. So why go so far as to um, ascribe or attach penal sanctions for that kind of complaint? If we want to do that, um, the worst we should do is attach civil damages to this mm. kind of thing, but not go so far as depriving a person of their liberty uh, for uh, the possible crime of making a false complaint. So those are the oh. main points, uh, main sticking points. But in addition to that, we'll be making um, suggestions for incorporation at the committee stage and in parliament or within in court let's, as well. uh, let's take a look at that after this short break, uh, in which we will uh, take a peek at this evening's uh, headlines uh, produced by that wonderful primetime news team. We'll see you on the other side of the break with Sankita Gunaratna from TISL. News First, Newsline with Faraz Shaukat Ali on TV1. Sri Lanka crush Ireland to seal test series and record 100th test win. Minister Ali Sabri speaks of a mysterious force that blocked Sri Lanka from approaching the IMF. Anura Kumara responds to President Vikrama Singh. Anti-terrorism bill delayed. Vijay Dasa says it will give more time to address concerns. Public sector employees who were to contest the local government election to return to service. Tata, a potential investor for Sri Lankan Airlines. News First wins silver at Presidential Environment Awards 2021-2022. News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukat Ali on TV1. And welcome back to Newsline recording with Sankita Gunratna from the Transparency International Sri Lanka organization. Um, Sankita, welcome again. Tell me, under this uh, anti-corruption bill, how safe or unsafe are whistleblowers? Yeah. There are provisions to protect whistleblowers under this law and at the same time we know that an amended victim or an updated victim witness protection law has been uh, placed on the order paper of parliament just this week uh, which we have not had the opportunity to peruse yet. Mm. Um, but there are certain provisions to protect whistleblowers under this law but uh, this section 119 is what we are a little concerned or, or quite concerned about because we uh, have to acknowledge the context that we operate in. In Sri Lanka, we are talking about a context in which corruption is widespread. You mentioned the Anti-Terrorism uh, Act or the bill at the start of the show. Um, and and we're looking at where protesters are, protests are quelled, where we have water cannons and you know possibly rubber bullets and everything being deployed. The power of state, the terror of state, being deployed against um, anyone who dissents against uh, a, a particular view. So it, it is in that context that we are trying to attach penal provisions to making a false complaint. Mm. What that then means is that people are constantly under the threat of being dragged through the courts, even if they are not found guilty at the end of the process, that is no um, solace to someone who is still dragged through courts, who still has to uh, find legal representation to mm. and, and um, possibly undergoes harm and damage and reputational damage purely for having tried to exercise their civic duty by complaining 
about corruption and corruption in this country has so many vested interests it is entrenched it is widespread it is systemic so and and you you have so many people and groups that are in power that have such vested interests in maintaining the status quo maintaining these levels of corruption then when you are coming up against that kind of power and you're pitching yourself against that by making a complaint do you really want a democles sword of um, you know possible penal sanction hanging over your head when doing so because it, it applies to even organizations like us because you'll have an additional layer of um, you know concern and strategizing and worrying to do before you take action against corruption mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> okay how does one uh, with this uh, anti-corruption bill um, so suppose it becomes law uh, what role can it play in the uh, in this perennial problem of um, procurement cr corruption you know state procurement on infrastructure development whatever things like that how how useful is this going to be or is that existing laws enough for that right so in terms of the nitty gritty and the process of procurement this law doesn't cover it so this is why we say even though this law is slated to be the law that incorporates all the provisions of the UN Convention Against Corruption into domestic law. It does not. Mm. It incorporates certain provisions of it, certain aspects of it, and it does so well. Um, however, on the issue of specifically procurement, it is still the 2006 procurement guidelines that would apply in Sri Lanka, and those remain guidelines and uh, still need to be converted into law they need to be updated they need to be simplified that process is really a complicated quagmire of rules mm. that really need to be looked at and we were in court just a month or less than a month ago obtaining um, interim relief from uh, the supreme court on on this controversial indian credit line uh, related procurement drug procurement so that remains a quagmire that needs to be addressed and is not uh, meant to be addressed under this law. There is a limited provision, there is, a, there is one provision that talks about uh, bribery for the purpose of with, withdrawing or procuring a tender mm -hmm. and that is covered under this law. Uh, but beyond that, this law doesn't solve or address or apply its mind to uh, apply to um, the issue of procurement. Excellent. And uh, just as we are, uh, we're going, we're broadcasting this, we also have heard that uh, the Minister of Justice, uh, Dr. Vijayadasa Rajapaksa, told Parliament earlier today that the tabling of the anti-terrorism bill will be further delayed considering requests put forward by various factions. But isn't that marvellous, that the other side is being heard? I think it's good that um, protests, uh, objections are being accounted for. But is it being done bona fide? And do you need to come to this stage really to hear the other side? This, I mean, the anti terrorism bill should not have seen the light of day. Mm -hmm. These conversations have happened. We have seen for decades how people have been victimized, how it has been uh, an instrument of state terror, mm. of abuse of due process against international conventions. It goes way beyond international conventions. And um, and, and it has been weaponized against minorities in these countries at different times and different stages of Sri Lanka's history, mm. uh, depending on how convenient it was. So it shouldn't have had to come to this stage for it to be recanted upon. I will not, uh, not being an expert on the Anti-Terrorism mm. Act, I will mm. not go further, much further on that. But I don't think they should be given credit for, government should be given credit for recanting on the position mm. when it shouldn't have been presented in at the first all place. in the first place. And uh, <clears throat> how come the anti-corruption bill has come uh, now? Are we to thank our precarious financial position and uh, the IMF regulations or the rules or the, uh, what they envisage to be uh, the rules? I would say partly. Uh, so it does form part of the agreement that the, uh, that the government has reached with the IMF to pass this by the end of June and an asset recovery law by the end of March 2024. Mm -hmm. However, 
we must be careful not to credit one government with this bill because this has been in the offing, has been in the works since at least 2018 when the bribery commission at that point was spearheading a national action plan on bribery and corruption and it's those elements that were then formed into a draft under the last government and further improved even with civil society with our input as well partly that has been partly incorporated not all the way um, under this government so this government in a sense is in a fortunate place mm. uh, where you get to take credit and bring to fruition laws that have been in the works for several years um, so you can also credit the precarious financial situation we are in, but I cannot emphasize enough how important it is not to put our hope just in this law, but to focus on the systemic reform that we need um, to ensure that our law enforcement can actually give effect to this law without merely being without it merely being limited to words on paper. Mm -hmm. We in Sri Lanka the lack of laws has never been the issue. If we wanted to prosecute high-level corruption, we have had law. Our current law is sufficient. Where's the breakdown then? It's in law enforcement. It's in uh, making sure that our law enforcement processes, our public officials are independent from politics. It's in ensuring resourcing. It's in ensuring um, the that you take away the self-censoring, the perceived power of politics, mm. uh, making sure that the law's delays are addressed. You, you just said something here. Now, and, and a few days ago, we had uh, uh, DIG Ajit Rohna uh, complaining uh, that his transfer was uh, not quite cricket in short. Uh, and I think he's now being uh, kept back at police headquarters. But that is a uh, glaring example of uh, what happens. Uh, state officials trying to do their job um, and they get transferred. Um, we had the instance in 20, uh, 2019 is it, uh, when Gautabi Rajapaksa came into power having won the presidential election. Uh, two days after uh, his uh, ascendancy, uh, he transferred out the director of the CID, one Shani Abe Sekra, who just happened to have uh, headed a team that investigated him before he became the president. And this is two days before, uh, even before appointing the prime minister. Uh, so we have this level of interference. Uh, I don't know whether it's corruption that is to be left to a court to decide, but uh, this level of interference to uh, turn up and you know obtain power and then just willy-nilly transfer people out, uh, surely... Uh, does this bill, this anti-corruption bill, will it help avoid this situation? Not necessarily. And, and to add to the list of things you mentioned, we must not forget the Political Victimization Commission, the Presidential Commission on Political Victimization that uh, sought to take action against law enforcement officials who had filed cases in court. And then it was under you know, under judicial scrutiny. And it's not necessarily, you know, action they had taken independently. So to answer your question, that is a larger problem that cannot be addressed through necessarily an anti-corruption bill. Mm. Um, that's why I was talking, this, this has been the call of the people, system change. And one of the big things was not just to send the incumbent president home, but also to get rid of the executive presidency, to get to do away with the centralization of power within one individual. And so we're making very slow steps towards it uh, through, say, the 21st Amendment to the Constitution, where the Constitutional Council has been reappointed, has been made a little more independent, but we're still not going far enough in making sure that we depoliticize the public sector, we depoliticize uh, key appointments, secretaries and ministers all being appointed by the president. So mm. it's very difficult to, to do away with this perception of interference, even where, and, and the fear of interference and reprisal, even where there isn't actual uh, interference or reprisal. Sankita Gunratna from TISL. Thank you very much for being on Newsline. Thank recording you. and that's the way it was it's now time for the prime time news take care have a great evening have a great uh, weekend as much as you can and god bless you all